we want to have an intimate time with Jesus. We're going to sing a few of our old time favorites and one that just resonates with my heart. And then we're going to sing a hymn to tag it at the end. Let's worship together. If you notice at home, sing with us. Come on, Dale. else to say. A hallelujah always sounds great. In moments in your life where you're like, okay, God, today is one of them days. I just dare you. Instead of complaining, <laughs> something that we're often good at doing, Dale, is complaining sometimes, instead of praising God. Yeah. yeah sometimes we can. For yeah. Sure. I dare you to switch the narrative versus telling God, how big your problem is, tell your problem 
how big our God is. <laughs> My mom used to always tell me that. She said, Jared, that. instead of complaining to a God that already knows the end to our problems, tell that problem how big your God is. <laughs> and when you get done, just say hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's sing this old hymn. It goes like this. Say hallelujah. 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 Let's sing it together. And hallelujah. at home. Hallelujah. Let's say, Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you. Come on. Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you. It's God. Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you. <laughs> Lord, we thank you over every situation. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Let's sing hallelujah last time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 Hey, Spring Creek fam, I am so excited to be with you here this morning. It is always an honor and a privilege. You know, whenever I get to speak the word of God, wasn't worship amazing? I just love worship. I love worship songs. I'm the person that drives in the car and listens to worship music, just blasted. I look crazy and I don't care about it. But there's a, a particular worship song that I am totally feeling lately. It's called Fresh Fire by Maverick City. I don't know if you heard it, but this song is everything. The song says, God, I burn for you. So come and consume me. My heart is ready. God, if I burn, I'll burn for you. With no hesitation, without reservations, God, if I burn, I'll burn for you. I'm definitely not one of those people who sing a song and not listen to the lyrics. When I heard this song, song for the first time, my first thought was how beautiful are these lyrics? It reminded me of when I gave my life to Jesus, of how much my heart desired to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, of how much I desire to be transformed and spend time in his presence, delighting in the pureness of who he is. It reminds me of all the hope I have experienced in his presence, the times where I couldn't stop talking about him, where the people around me couldn't understand my overwhelming desire to be in the presence of God. I wanted to be with him all the time, and I wanted to be with others who loved him just as much as I love him. I wanted to learn more about God and couldn't wait to dive into my Bible and absorb everything I could and then hear what the pastor and the teachers of the word were teaching as well. I truly was living the words of the song when it says, God, if I live, I'll live for you. I love your presence. You're my obsession. I think of how many times we've sung worship songs that become common to us and singing it becomes a routine. 
We can recite the words without even thinking about the gravity and the importance of the words that we are singing. Like the lyrics that continue, I want to burn for you, for all the world to see, Holy Spirit come. So light a match and let it go, set ablaze, uncontrolled. And that last line, it's so simple, yet so powerful. I want that fire. I want that fire. In the Bible, fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit's power and presence. Fire illuminates, it warms, it refines, it purifies, and can transform material to a completely different form than how it started off. In Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist tells the people of, uh, uh, of the coming of Jesus by saying, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The fire that's described in this song is the power of his presence that dwells in our hearts, that passion for his presence, the power that produces purity. So when we sing, I want that fire, we are saying, I want the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that controls every part of my life. But I wonder how many times we sing these beautiful songs of worship about being filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit and don't really mean it with our hearts. This is the type of fire that Jeremiah describes when he says in Jeremiah 29, but if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak in his name, his word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones. I am worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. That is the fire that I felt as a new believer. And just in the same way, I can remember so many times when I haven't felt that fire, where I felt nothing at all. Here's the thing about the fire. The power of the Holy Spirit is that we must maintain that fire. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, don't put out the Spirit's fire. In the Old Testament, the Lord instructs Moses how to present a guilt offering to him when the people sin against each other and have been unfaithful to the Lord. It says in, Levit in Leviticus, Chapter six, verses eight through 13. Then the Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons the following instructions regarding the burnt offering. The burnt offering must be left on the top of the altar until the next morning. And the fire on the altar must be kept burning all night. In the morning, after the priest on duty has put his official linen clothing and linen undergarments, he must clean out the ashes of the burnt offering and put them beside the altar. Then he must take off these garments, change back into his regular clothes, and carry the ashes outside the camp to a place that is ceremoni cer ceremonially clean. Meanwhile, the fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must never go out. Each morning, the priest will add fresh wood to the fire and arrange the burnt offering on it. He will then burn the fat of the peace offerings on it. Remember, lastly, the fire must be kept burning on the altar at all times. It must never go out. Here is the question I want to ask you today. Is your fire fading? Is your fire burning out? Have you lost your passion and desire to be in the presence of God? You might be thinking, you know, how do I even know if I've lost my fire? What, I mean, what does that even look like? Well, I know what that looks like for me, but have you ever developed a negative perspective? Do you only focus on the negative aspects of every situation and your hope in God is not even evident to all the people around you? Are you relying on your feelings instead of the promises in God's word, the things that God has spoken into your life? Is everything all about you? Do you believe every situation, good or bad, has you in the center of it and you can't even see how God may be using it for his glory? Are you compromising your beliefs? Are you complacent towards sin or do you justify your sin? Are you unwilling to forgive? Have you lost your passion for serving or, or, or maybe you just don't see the value in it anymore? Maybe you haven't been sharing the good news and guess what? No one even knows that you're a Christ follower. Do you desire affirmation from the world on social media, your friends, your family, or promotions at work? 
Have you begun, be, begun to view God's word as a set of restrictions instead of freedom in Jesus? Has your behavior changed? Are you treating others as you would treat the Lord? Maybe your thoughts don't honor God anymore. Maybe you don't desire fellowship with, with him anymore. Maybe you delight in other people instead of God. Are you unable to see your flaws? Maybe you hear the Holy Spirit giving you direction, but you ignore him anyway. A.W. Tozer said, the Holy Spirit never talks to the shallow man. If you are shallow, you cannot hear the voice of the Lord. The Holy Spirit never talks to the self-defender, the person who believes he is right and will defend his right to be what he is. He never talks to the arguer, to the afflicted person, or to the insincere. Why? Why? Because when we are living in those conditions, we are unwilling and unable to hear what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us. Have you, ever, have you ever heard the saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy? I bet you have. And all the ladies in the house said, amen. Even though many of us, you know, say this in a funny way, there's some truth to this statement. When we had kids living in our home, I remember the best days were the days where I had time to cook a nice meal, put the plates on the table, clean the kitchen as I cook, and throw away the trash so that after dinner there was minimal cleanup and there were no fights on who was going to clean the kitchen. I mean, every single mom has this dream of this type of dinner. My motivation was to create an atmosphere that our family could sit and eat dinner together and just enjoy each other's time with no distractions. Then I remember the other days, lots and lots of other days where we would be rushing off to soccer practice and we threw our food in plastic bowls as we're scrambling through the house to find the shin guards and the cleats that were supposed to be in the soccer bag. And when we finally get in the car with our bowls of food and everything we're going to take to, to the soccer field, we would devour our food as I sped down the road so that we weren't late again to practice. And the difference between the two is that in the first scenario, I had time to create an atmosphere that was peaceful, calming, inviting, and warm so that my family could sit together and enjoy each other. And then in the second scenario, I was completely frazzled. The kids were frazzled and that created a hectic atmosphere where we were tired, uh, we were arguing and just trying to survive the day. Has anyone ever had a day like that? The second scenario isn't necessarily bad. It's just the atmosphere I created because for one reason or, an, or another, we just couldn't get organized enough to create a peaceful transition from school to home to soccer practice. But that is the power of atmosphere. So when we say, if mama's not happy, nobody's happy, that just means that we have the power to set the atmosphere of what we are expecting in our environments. But I think that phrase is not just about moms. This is about all people. So the question we must ask ourselves is, is your atmosphere contributing to keeping your fire burning? Let me tell you about King Josiah of Judah and how he dealt with the problems with his atmosphere that contributed to the diminishing fire of a whole nation. King Josiah understood the power of atmosphere. Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor, King David. We all remember King David, right? He did not turn away from doing what was right. When Josiah was 26 years old, he initiated a program that would restore and repair the temple of the Lord using money collected from the people. The high priest was in charge of the project, and in the middle of the repairs, he found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. It was read to King Josiah, and when he heard what was written in the book of the law, he tore his clothes in despair and grief because he realized how far they had wandered from God. Their fire had faded, and now they were unrecognizable as a chosen people of God. They realized that their ancestors had not obeyed the word of the Lord. The high priest took the scroll to, to a prophetess of God who confirmed that the Lord is going to bring disaster on Judah and its people because the Lord said, for my people have abandoned me and offered sacrifices to pagan gods and I am very angry with them for everything they have done. My anger will burn against this place and it will not 
be quenched. Understanding that in order to turn the hearts of the people back to God, Josiah read the entire book of the covenant of the law to all people, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Because part of setting the right atmosphere is filling yourself with the word of God. You see, the word is a mirror unto our soul. And that's why so many people are afraid of reading the word because they don't want to recognize the truth to see who they really are and the conditions that they're really in. They could not deny what God said because it was written in his word. Now that they know better, it was time to do better. Josiah's original goal was to restore the physical temple where the people would worship the Lord, but God showed him that the condition of the heart was of greater importance. And to restore that, they needed to focus on creating an atmosphere of true repentance, which means to turn around and go in the opposite direction to show a change in thinking and attitude towards sin and towards God. Now it was time to focus on their physical atmosphere. Josiah removed the articles in the Lord's temple that were used to worship other gods. Then he burned them. He removed the idolatrous priests who offered sacrifices in, uh, to these idols, all the medians, the psychics, the household gods, idols, and every other detestable practice in Judah. He tore down the places the, the, that were desecrated by prostitution in the Lord's temple. He defiled and he smashed and ground to dust the pagan shrines and altars. He demolished all the buildings of the pagan shrines. And lastly, if that wasn't enough, Josiah in 2 Kings 23:20 executed the priests of the pagan shrines on their own altars and he burned human bones on the altars to desecrate them. Finally, he returned to Jerusalem. Josiah was able to make these changes after and only after that he read the truth of the word of God. It was the word that set a fire to his soul and moved him to action by the power of the Holy Spirit that led him to aggressively make the changes that he needed to, that, that needed to be made. I like to use the word aggressively because when we're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, it, it moves us to do things that we would have never imagined we would have done on our own. He was led to remove things, people, places that were not uh, contributing to walking in the power of the one and only true living God. And not just to remove, but, but he smashed them, he demolished them, and he burnt it down so there would be nothing to return to. I wonder what things God is asking us to remove, to smash, to demolish and burn down in our lives so that we could ignite and keep the fire of the Holy Spirit burning inside. I remember when I was a new believer and I had to learn this lesson. Because of my character flaws and personal struggles, I remember the Holy Spirit leading me to change the music I was listening to, to change the things I was reading, to evaluate the movies I was watching, to break relationships that were becoming a hindrance in my spiritual growth to evaluate the things I was saying and change the places I was going. My whole life changed when my atmosphere was, was contributing to keeping my fire burning. But this is not just something that happened to me in the beginning of my journey with the Lord. The Holy Spirit is constantly dealing with me about maintaining an atmosphere that honors God because before we know it, small compromises lead to a, a fading flame or maybe even a flame that has been completely extinguished. Talking about small compromises. These last six months when my husband traveled back and forth from Florida, I spent a lot of time alone. After work, I would go home, eat dinner, dessert, lots and lots of snacks, while I binge watch scary movies and shows. I must have watched two seasons of The Walking Dead literally in three days. I was staying up super late because I was all sugared up with all the junk food I was eating as I watched all the shows. I came to work exhausted and sluggish, and after a couple of days of overindulging, I started feeling conviction about what I was doing. There, there, there isn't anything inherently wrong with watching scary movies and eating junk food, but because of my personal struggles and my character flaws, I could hear the Holy Spirit warning me of my lack of discipline. 
You see, the Holy Spirit deals with each of us in our own way. So what the Holy Spirit is dealing with me about may not be the same things that the Holy Spirit is dealing with you about. So I decided to ignore the Holy Spirit and start season three of The Walking Dead. Yup, I did. I ignored the Holy Spirit. After the first episode, I went to bed and had a terrible nightmare where I heard someone walk in my room and grab me while I was sleeping. Y'all, I didn't know if, a, if it was a zombie or the devil got me. Either way, the next morning I repented because I was feeling so lonely. And instead of satisfying my craving for companionship with God's presence, I tried to satisfy the craving with junk food and scary movies, which only made me desire the unhealthy behavior more. See, it may seem silly, but those were small compromises that were personally diminishing my flame. First Corinthians 10, 23 says, everything is permitted, you say? Maybe, but not everything is helpful. Everything is permitted? Maybe, but not everything is edifying. So a better question is, what things in your life are in place of the Holy Spirit? You see, we all get all of the Holy Spirit. But does the Holy Spirit have all of you? Maybe you're just too busy for God. Maybe God is just not a priority. Maybe you're just too busy trying to be successful. What unhealthy cravings have we fed that contribute to our diminishing fire? The definition of cra craving is an intense desire for some particular thing, something you long for, desire eagerly, and want greatly. Because whatever we feed will grow. If you feed your children, they will grow. If you feed and fertilize your plants, hopefully they will grow. If you feed yourself lots of lots of sugar, your cravings will grow. If you feed yourself a healthy desire, if you feed your healthy desires, your desire will grow for unhealthy things. 1 John 2, 15 and 16 say, uh, says, Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not, these are not from the Father, but are from this world. Lisa Turkers writes in her book, Made to Crave, I believe God made us to crave. Now, before you think this is some sort of cruel joke by God, let me assure you that the object of our craving was never supposed to be food or other things. People find themselves consumed by such as sex or money or chasing after significance. Yes, we were made to crave, long for, want greatly, desire eagerly, and beg for God, only God. If you feed your craving to be in the presence of God, your fire will grow and burn strong and bright. Psalm 84, uh, one, 1 and 2 says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of the heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord with my whole being, body and soul. I will shout joyfully to the living God. Here's what we should be asking ourselves. Do we really crave God like that? Do we feed that desire to be in God's presence so that our passion for God can grow? Or do we allow that fire to fade away? So you, you might be thinking, how do we know if we are walking in the spirit? Well, we can take the fruit test, not to be confused with spiritual gifts and talents and abilities. It's, it's not gifting that shows the fruit of the spirit. I mean, I can have the gift to preach, but am I demonstrating the fruit of the spirit in my life? And what I like to say is I can preach the best message in the world, but if I walk off that altar and live my life in a completely different way than what the words were coming out of my mouth, then I'm not living by the spirit. We can have the most talented musicians in the world, but is God the Lord of their lives? The Bible says in Galatians 5, 22 uh, through 25, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. So the question is not, am I filled with the spirit? The question is, do you see fruit in me? Does your spouse see fruit in you? Do your children see fruit in you? Do your friends see fruit in you? 
Do your coworkers see fruit in you? Do your neighbors see fruit in you? Do strangers see fruit in you, in, in, in your life? And some of you are probably getting nervous right now thinking, please don't ask my husband, please don't ask my children about whether they see fruit of the spirit in me, right? Because sometimes we do act a little differently at home than, 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 than when we're out in the world. In the book, The Fruit of the Spirit by Trask and Goodall, they make a great observation about Billy Graham's take on the difference between fruits and fruit. They say, it is interesting that the Bible talks of the fruit of the spirit rather than the fruits. A tree may bear many apples, but all come from the same tree. In the same way, the Holy Spirit is the source of all the fruit in our lives. I love that so much because basically what they are saying is that many of us are connected to the wrong sources. Many of us are connected to sources that are actually poisoning our lives instead of giving us life in Jesus. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 28, for our God is a consuming fire. Are you ready to surrender all of who, uh, all, all of who you are, all of you to the Holy Spirit so that you can be consumed by fire? I love that word consumed so much because when you think about the word consumed, it means it, it comes over you from the bottom of the feet of your feet to the top of your head. That means it, it, your flame is, is burning bright and that people can see it from far so that so when you are in that fire, it will refine you. It will purify you. It will transform you to becoming more like Christ. Then you must be willing to empty yourself so that we can be filled with the Spirit. A.W. Tozer said, the Holy Spirit will never fill a man or woman who refuses to give up and give over to him full control of their lives. Keep one compartment of your life back from the Holy Spirit, and it grieves him that he cannot go any further. Yield to the Holy Spirit and the process of drawing closer to him. Satisfy your cravings with the presence and the power of God. You see, when I was watching all those movies and how he's eating all that food, that's where I went wrong, is that in the midst of those cravings, I didn't turn to the Lord. And what was happening is all those uh, behaviors were tearing away at my self-discipline to be in relationship with God. John 4, 13 and 14 says, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him shall never thirst again. But the water that I will give him will become, it, will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. He is the one true source of life. It's not a one-time act that we fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit. In order to do this, we must stay connected to his true source. John 15, 1 through 8 says, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that, uh, you, so that they will produce even more. You, you have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. You see, just in those couple of three verses, God is telling us, I'm already doing a work in you. And the things that are, that are not supposed to be there, I am removing from you little by little. This is not something that happens overnight. This is a process that takes place. Verse four continues, remain in me and I will remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Guys, that means that we must stay connected to God. How do we stay connected uh, to God? We stay connected through his word. We stay connected by speaking with God, not just in our devotional time, but all day. Every single time that we think about something, we are having a conversation with God. Verse five says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I love this verse so much because the truth is we can't do anything without God. How many times in my prayer life I say, God, you are my every single breath. I can't live without you, Lord, because he has become everything for me. And I recognize I can't make decisions on my own. Verse six says, anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. 
Verse 7, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Verse 8, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my father. Trask and good old note, Jesus said in John 15, 1, I am the true Alethinos vine. He could have said, I am a vine or I am the vine, but he wanted to emphatically uh, communicate to his disciples that he is the only vine that is legitimate. The meaning of the original word Alethinos is true, real, and genuine. In other words, you can be connected to things and people that can make you believe that you are thriving and living your best life, but there is only one true life-giving source, and that is Jesus. I bet the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, challenging you about what needs to be done to continue your fi- to, to keep your fire going or to ignite a fire that has that has already been extinguished. Let's pray so that the Holy Spirit can give you the strength and direction on how to draw closer to him. God, we thank you for this day that you have given us. Father, I pray for all those people right now, Lord, who know that you are speaking to them, Father God. Their hearts are beating so fast because they know that there are things in their life, Father, that you are trying to remove, Lord Jesus. They know, Father, that they don't have the atmosphere that's going to keep their fire going, but the atmosphere that they have created, Father, is actually diminishing their fire. Lord, we ask you to give them strength. We ask you to give them courage. Lord, we ask you, Father, that you would continue, Lord, to work in their lives, Father, so that they would move in the direction that they need to move in, that they would create the atmosphere, Father, that honors you, Lord, that you would prepare their hearts, Lord Jesus, so that they could do the things that you are calling them to do. Father, we thank you, Lord, because we know that you are a good God. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, the conversation doesn't end here. Make sure that you connect with us online in at Spring Creek Church, online on Facebook. Guys, see you during the week.